Hey guys, this is Future Sean editing the podcast with another cold opening. So I'm drinking Yakrut as I am editing this podcast and informing you guys that we're very sorry for another delay in the release of this episode because of the end of the school year. So with the end of the academic year, hopefully our future episodes will be much more consistent and on schedule for you guys. But for now, I also want to apologize for the audio quality of our special guest, but we hope that his information does help you in some way, shape, or form. But let's go on with the intro. Hey guys, welcome to Tea Party, a podcast where two Asian American high school students give you the latest tea on down the middle politics and what it's like to be a student from our generation all while drinking tea. How are you, Sean? I am doing so much better than I have been lately because I have made the decision to switch to living on Taiwan time rather than US time. (laughs) Finally, I knew... You, you, you like waking up at like 2 a.m. and that was crazy. I don't even know why. You, I don't, I don't understand your motivation for doing that. Well, I can't miss any of the meetings. Are you drinking something? Oh, that's a very good question. Right now, I am drinking some Taiwanese soy milk where they boil the soybeans before they juice it instead of just juicing it. Soy milk. Well, I can't talk because I'm eating a cupcake because I have had two yakuts today and I'm not inclined to go through my yakut stock that quickly. So hence the cupcake. We are very much not owning up to the title of this podcast. Oh, well, we'll get back to it sooner or later. All right. So <clears throat> today for our tea and student life segments combined... We will be talking about the IB during quarantine. So I'm sure many members of our audience are familiar with, quote unquote, the IB. And there's a monstrous Wikipedia page in the show notes if you are not familiar. And instead of trying to make the information on the wiki sensible in about 10 minutes of what we have here, what we're here for is an explanation of what doing the IB is like during a time like quarantine. Uh... Actually, I will tell you the IB mission statement before we start, which is to develop globally minded critical thinkers who are able to develop their own opinions and must take six core subjects in addition to two OK whilst also completing the EE and CAS. Very long. Yes. What is unfortunate is the heightened difficulty of following this statement when you can't actually go to school. Um, yeah. So, yeah, to join us today is Nathan Bay, a current IB student going to senior year and second year of IB. How are you, Nathan? I'm good. Thank you guys so much for having me on here. How are the both of you? (laughs) It's a pleasure. We love having guests on here. So we'd like to kick off our questions, Sean. Yes. So before we actually get to the billion dollar question, how do you feel about the whole shenanigans with the AP exam and the College Board Dilemma as an IB student? Yeah, so this is something that has been going around on social media for quite some time and some YouTube videos that have been made about it. Um, As an IB student and someone who doesn't have to take exams this year because IB actually canceled exams, I feel very relieved that I am not in that situation. Um, I think really there's an issue with, you know, equity, and that's something that IB really tries to teach you, um, is equity giving everyone a chance to show their skills, um, to test in the subject that they've studied, or is it not giving out the test because there are these discrepancies in whether people can turn in their test, um, the internet connection, many different factors. So I think as an IB student, I'm, I'm feeling very lucky to (laughs) not be in that position. If, uh, if the IB organization, the the international organization, if they had decided to host IB exams this year, do you think you would have been in a similar situation as the AP students who were struggling to turn in their exams? Do you think it would have been like similarly difficult for you? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it obviously would depend on how IB administers the test, but overall, you know, 
I guess online testing has its own caveats. And so I don't think there would be like a lot of differences between what the college board decides and what IB decides. Yeah. Okay. So I've heard that uh, Ivy is doing, is making you do the, um, what is it called? The internal assessment, the IAs, the internal assessment. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Instead of the exams. So are you trying extra hard on those instead? Or is it a... Yeah, I mean, um, those IAs do carry a lot of significant weight. Um, in some of my classes, they're making the IAs my finals, actually. So oh. what I get on the IA will go into the final category. Um, so there's definitely a lot of pressure. And I actually think that doing the IA, too, is in itself an equity issue as well, because... Mm-hmm. Um, the IA obviously depends on um, many different factors, just like testing. So ultimately, there isn't really a perfect like solution. But as part as a student in the IB program, um, I do think that IAs are a better way to assess student knowledge than like tests that are restricted to a specific time, um, a specific file format, you know. Now, here is the billion dollar question, as Sean has dubbed it. Uh, It's just the most important part of this segment, I guess you could say, which is what is the Ivy organization doing to help the students complete the course requirements while in quarantine? Yeah, so IB has put in some standards, I guess, in place. Um, As you guys probably know, they canceled the exams. So at least how my school is doing it, um, the way it's kind of working is they're going to take IAs, which are internal assessments, and along with our kind of general performance in the class, as well as maybe some classwork, that's what they're going to use to ultimately decide our score. Okay, so they'll give you, they're going to give you a score for the class from 1 to 7 based on your performance and your IAs, basically? Yep. Okay, that's an interesting system. What yeah. do you think, Sean? Did they cut anything from the um, curriculum? Our teachers set in stone some like essential learning standards, and so that's kind of being considered part of the coursework as well. Um, I think by far the most significant factor, though, is the IA. That is probably a huge chunk of what determines the score. Okay. Mm. Um, I, for, we're, since for the, our listeners, we all go to the same school for, and for regular classes for me and Sean, we both, we also have essential learnings for our regular classes. So for like my history class, we have to learn, you know, all through World War II and then it would have been post-World War II, I believe. Um, but I think, for our classes, for like on level classes or just honors classes, it will have a huge effect on us if we sacrifice some of the content that we are meaning to get to by the end of the year. But from what I know, I believe IB is known for being like really in you, you do a lot of research, like in depth research into different topics. Do you think you're going to be missing some of that experience of going in depth into topics by just focusing on essential learnings? Yeah, I think there definitely is a drawback to just focusing on essential learning. And, you know, obviously there will be some sacrifices that will have to be made. Um, but yes, I do feel like by, uh, by kind of restricting the content to a few essential pieces, um, as an IB student, you do miss out on a lot of the content that you otherwise would be getting from teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> However, a good part of it is that it is essential. So what (laughs) you are learning is, you know, probably worth worth your time if the teacher thinks so. Yeah. Okay. I love that point of view. I mean, for to be honest, I've been ignoring my essential learning for quite some time now. (laughs) Oh, me too. (laughs) I like the optimistic analysis. (laughs) That's just the difference between an IV student and a non-IV student. Um, (laughs) Speaking of these differences, uh, who's more stuck up? I know we all want to know. Uh, Are IB students or AP students more stuck (laughs) up than the other? I love this question. This is my favorite question. This question could be debated on for like more than a week. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, it is IB students. Um, Mm. Just from my personal experience with um, in my TOK class, just some comments and memes that I've seen online. It just seems like just a part of the IB personality or a cult to 
essentially hate AP kids and <laughs> kind of like demean their hard work because we do more work than them. So oh. yeah, yeah, it is definitely very <laughs> prominent, I guess, in those <laughs> in that IV identity. Um, especially if you look on those like meme pages on Instagram. Yeah, I see those. So many TikToks about like AP kids versus IV kids. Yeah. yeah. You're saying it in a very nice way. I like the way you phrase it. It's like, oh, it's part of the culture. And then yeah. I just probably other people would be like, IB students are so stuck up or something yeah. like that. <laughs> no, but I do agree that they are definitely stuck up. Um, you know, a lot of these people, um, and honestly, this goes for AP kids too, but like, yeah. we all we all want someone to you know, admire us for, you know, the challenges or everything <laughs> that's yeah. going wrong with, you know, like I've overcome so much compared to you. So oh, like hair uh, I'm just kind of <laughs> so superior. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, but as a final, like touched up on that question, do you think it's, uh, do you think that kind of stuck up culture is, is, is part of like, I know you can't really answer this with evidence because you only go to the skyline right but do you think it could be more of a product of the skyline's culture other than just the ib culture so do you think like regular skyline students who don't take ib diploma would be in general like uh, a normal level stuck up like how does that yeah i think it's a very complex but interesting question <laughs> yeah. um, you know a lot of people at skyline you know we are in a relatively like affluent community Mm -hmm. such um but i think to some extent it does have to do with ib as well because i mean unless you're like forced to do ib by your parents like generally people (laughs) yeah yeah those kids um generally people who do join ib are they do it because they are very motivated um they have different reasons for doing so whether it's you know going to college becoming a more open-minded person Mm -hmm. so i think definitely the type of people that ib attracts are definitely more of like the ambitious types which is not to say that people who don't do ib aren't ambitious yeah but consider academically that it is, yeah consider that it is a very like rigorous program i would expect there to be kind of i would expect it to be part of the culture especially because of just the stress it puts on students and okay. the type of students it attracts it's a unique mix well, uh, thank you, Nathan, for joining us today. Thank you. We really appreciate your very unique insight into this <laughs> monstrous program. Monstrous is an understatement. No, yeah, I. <laughs> yes, monstrous is actually a pretty good word to describe it. Um, I had really fun. I had a lot of fun talking with you guys, though. So thank you for inviting me to this podcast. <laughs> and honestly, the work you guys do is so amazing. I'm sure Aww. you guys are in good <laughs> shape for IB and developing your critical thinking skills. Thank I like you. the optimism. <laughs> I would really <laughs> like to know that I am ready for IB because it's coming. <laughs> right. We will so. see. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It is time for our politics segment, and boy, oh boy, do we have a lot of politics to be talking about, Sean. <laughs> so sensitive during this time, and yeah. I cannot get away from it for my life. None of us can get away from it. It's it's on my Twitter feed every single day. It's like, like 100% of my Twitter feed, and then it's all I see on the news. Oh my god, we're gonna get to this conversation later. Twitter. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, Twitter. We're gonna talk about Twitter. But before that, uh, the topic at hand is if this episode is released, look, I, I mean, no matter what we release, it's gonna be relevant. This isn't gonna end anytime soon. Nope. The George Floyd protest. So I'm sure everyone knows about this. The death of George Floyd um, it was a very tragic incident that happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, in which a white police officer um, knelt on his neck for about, I think it was 8 minutes and 46 seconds, which is a very long time, and he ended up dying because of that. And then um, it set off this huge, you know, network of national protests that has been going on for like a week and a half now, Sean? Yeah, Yeah, it was like, it's been like every single night and like every major city you can think of. I know here in Seattle, we've had um, Seattle protests going on for a week. The ones in Minneapolis, we have 
<laughs> sorry, we have ones in Los Angeles, New York City.、Uh, And it's not probably... just the big cities. There's also protests in the small cities, including the city where we live, or suburbs. Oh yeah, Sammamish. There was yeah, but the the the, the smaller city ones are less, you know,、um, controversial. Controversial.、There's, yeah, talk about such controversy. You wouldn't think that a a topic like Is is racism valid? Is is should be controversial? Obviously, as a podcast, we do not endorse racism, and then we support the Black Lives Matter movement. But there's been controversy over something else related to the protests, which is the violence. So,、um, there have been many. <laughs> yeah, son, that's the mood. No,、um, there's been many allegations of violence against peaceful protesters at these protests. I know there was this one video that went viral on Twitter、uh, that happened in Seattle, where it's it just imagine a huge crowd of peaceful protesters separated from a line of police officers by a single barrier. I've seen this video so many times. I can. Describe you exactly what it looked like. What, what barrier is it? Like a, a metal, you know, like those、um, bike stands. You know, metal bike stands.、Mm, yes. Think of those,、yes. but like a whole line of those, but separating a huge crowd from like a line of police officers and riot gear. Oh my、um, god, that does not sound good. That sounds yeah. Like already, you can tell. Right, it's just it's probably a lot of tension going around at the time. And then one woman at the at the front of the crowd was holding an umbrella as self defense against tear gas, which have been, which has been deployed against protesters very often lately. So、mm-hmm. this woman was holding an umbrella. It wasn't like the it wasn't like expanded. It was just a closed umbrella. And then it happened to extend over the barrier. And then a police officer grabbed it. Right. Oh my. And then she. And then she tried to pull it back because she's like, you know, I it's my umbrella. I、it's, haven't attacked yeah, you with this umbrella.、Item. Yeah, it's、and、a personal item. Umbrellas are extremely rare in Seattle. I don't know what you guys are thinking. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I I love how you say you guys. Like, so I wait. How long have you been living in Seattle again? A good deal of time since,、uh, like, But, almost years. But still, I don't understand. That's enough time to consider yourself a Seattle. Seattle Seattleans are known for braving the rain without umbrellas or anything. But you know, she, anyway. So back to the protest.、Um, she tried to pull the umbrella back from the officer, and then the officer pulled out his tear gas. And then simultaneously, the whole line of police officers started firing tear gas, and this、oh、huge crowd started like you know pulling away from the tear gas because you know tear gas is very bad for your eyes, bad、yes. for your clothes and face and everything. So that's just one example of the violence that has been going around, going on、uh, at these protests. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> like this violence, as you can tell, isn't like the fault of one particular side or the other, but it's just been so destructive to what like everyone has been trying to say, and like all the messages that we're trying to get across. The violence has become a bigger news issue, in other words, than the Black Lives Matter movement itself. However, separate from the protests, there have been a lot of rioting going on, especially in major cities.、Um, the burning of businesses, the looting of businesses.、Um, yeah, I mean, but that's that's the thing that's dominating the news more、uh, news a lot nowadays, which you could say is controversial, considering how this a greater importance has been placed. On said looting and rioting than on the peaceful protests. Would you agree, Sean? Yep, because that generates more views for the people spreading the news, which in turn generates more economic benefits. <laughs> That was a very logical analysis. Yeah, to, to put it lightly, we like put it. We like putting it lightly and logically on this podcast. As a download with a podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Sean in a blanket fort editing the podcast, hoping for good sound quality. I'm using this opportunity in the conversation to give you guys an idea of how to respond with、um, all of the events going on. So, there is an event called Racism, a virtual youth awareness conference, planned by the City of Issaquah government and the Issaquah Youth Advisory Board, which I am a part of. And this event will be on Thursday, July second, from three thirty p.m. to five thirty p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I will include the Eventbrite registration link down in the show notes. So this event is very interesting because it involves our community members and all the way from middle school to high school students、um, in both 
uh, presentation as well as a lot of breakout room discussions. Um, so we will be talking and discussing about subtle racism, systemic racism, the influence of media, as well as how to have difficult conversations, which is adapted from my PSA, actually. So I would highly recommend that you guys go sign up and join our discussion. It will be a lot of fun, and you can showcase your knowledge from the listening to this podcast when I give my presentation as a special speaker. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you guys there. Um, all right, so go register for the Eventbrite and the Zoom link. Um, and finally, coming to the political, politi- political, political uh, part of the segment, other than just so- social and cultural, um, which is the debate on what to do next. Um, there's been arguments from many sides as to how to deal with both the protests and the large issue that the protests are centered around. And the argument currently seems to be around reforming the police versus defunding the police versus abolishing the police. So. So, yeah. Have you heard about this debate, Sean? I indeed have. So I, n- I haven't been on Twitter as much as you have, Eunice, but... I've been on Twitter 24-7. Yes. <laughs> we will talk about this later, but yeah. Instagram has been filled with plenty of activists. And regarding that one hashtag about Blackout Tuesday, a uh, comment on one of the posts of my one of my cr- uh, favorite creators, and someone actually commented on my comment asking me to defund the police and sending me a link. Now, I didn't interact with that comment, but it was fun how a couple days later, someone actually replied to that comment saying, would you rather support free working people or like rioting protesters? And that, huh. that is a very interesting side of just yeah. how social media can really galvanize this, even though is it not Twitter? And it's not designed. It's not even Twitter. Twitter's yeah. the most like argument filled place on the internet besides, I don't know, Reddit. Instagram is mild compared to Twitter, you could say. <clears throat> so how would you describe reforming versus defunding versus abolishing the police? Yeah. So those are the three policies that are being suggested right now um, in response to police brutality. Um, and it, it becomes progressively more, you could say, more left on the political spectrum when you, like reforming is relatively moderate, moderate, a moderate standpoint. This is a standpoint that's shared by uh, many Congress people, especially representatives in the House of Representatives right now, which are trying to um, create policies to reform um, police departments. Um, reforming just means more implicit bias training in order to, you know, prevent implicit bias like such as racism um on the sides of police officers like preventing police officers from looking at a black person thinking oh this person's probably more dangerous than that white person across the street so that's what that's mainly what reforming is centered around there i think there's other aspects of that that i don't know of but actually so are there the do the i I don't know if you know this but do the reforms um contain like material reform like their equipment Equipment, I think, yes. Yeah. So I think demilitarizing the police is part of reforming the police, but reforming just means um, uh, not making any edits to the budget of the police department, how much money is given to the police department, but changing how the money is spent. Ah, okay. In contrast to that, uh, defunding the police means um, just taking away part the, the, the part of the city budget that is being currently spent on the police department, taking away part of that and directing that towards other community programs, which have been allegedly shown to be more effective than um, policing through police departments, especially for minor like minor offenses, such as um, offenses, including drugs. Mm-hmm. So that's defunding. And that one, I believe, is uh, more popular nowadays than reforming so right so defunding is less in theory than reforming and is more concrete but it's also way more controversial so yeah so it, beca- it becomes more controversial as you keep going so def- reforming is like not controversial in terms of like it's not called radical uh it's controversial in that people call it ineffective but defunding is more ra- it's considered more radical than reforming and abolishing is the most radical policy out there 
Right. And it also increases in uh, difficulty as the policies get more quote unquote yeah. radical. All right, Eunice, thank you for potting with me. <laughs> it's been an honor. Uh, this podcast is edited by Sean. Uh, the producers of this show is Eunice and Sean. The graphic design work for the episode out of Sema Eunice. This podcast is hosted on Anchor.fm. The music you're hearing right now and at the beginning of the podcast is by Mozart for his opera, The Magic Flute. You can email us at atpartypodcast at gmail.com for any of your phrase of the week suggestions. Uh, you can also follow us on social media, particularly Instagram on AT Party, at atpartypodcast. And like the brothers green, always say, don't, don't forget, forget to, to be, be awesome. awesome.